On our newscast tonight, beads are not considered jewelry unless woven together. President Park Geun-hye takes her creative economy pitch to the World Economic Forum, where she tells the importance of weaving entrepreneurship and creative ideas together to form new markets and new jobs. After being the subject of endless criticism, Korea's rival parties show signs that they may be getting their acts together. They announced new plans geared toward becoming more efficient. After three days as a hostage at the hands of Libyan kidnappers, a Korean trade official is safely rescued. We get the details from our foreign affairs correspondent. Stay with us for these stories and more. It is 4 a.m. in Washington, 11 a.m. in Tripoli, and 6 on a Thursday evening here in Seoul. I'm Kim yeon -ji. Welcome to Early Edition at 6. I'm Daniel Che. Today we begin with more on measures to prevent catastrophic data leaks here in the nation. In the wake of Korea's worst ever personal data breach, the two chairmen of the nation's financial regulators appeared at the National Assembly on Thursday. There they outlined their plans for handling the crisis. Our Kim yeon -gil has more. With the country still in shock after the personal information of some 20 million clients was stolen from local banks and credit card firms in Korea, the heads of the country's financial watchdogs appeared before a parliamentary policy committee on this Thursday to present their plans for addressing the data breach. Choi su the governor of the Financial Supervisory Service, said more than 2 million cardholders have canceled their credit cards, applied for new ones since Monday. He also said some 25 million people, equivalent to 28 percent of the country's economically active population, have logged on to the websites of the three card firms, KB Kungmin, NH Nongyeop and Lotte, to check whether their personal information had been breached. The three card firms are currently running a joint 24-hour hotline in conjunction with the Financial Supervisory Service. For now, there haven't been any additional secondary damages. Shin Jae-yoon, the chairman of the Financial Services Commission, said the regulator will strengthen monitoring of staff at financial firms who deal with data protection and their contractors, enhance regulations on the sharing of customer information between affiliates, and consider whether top executives at financial firms should face suspension or dismissal. We are coming up with measures to levy fines of up to 1 percent of the revenue of financial institutions if they use customer data to sell their financial products. In addition, a task force headed by the FSC vice chairman is planning to demand each financial institution submit customer data protection plans by the end of January. The task force will announce its own customer protection plan next month, and the FSC said it will submit revisions to various consumer financial protection acts to the National Assembly later in the month. Kim young gil Arirang News. Well, staying at Parliament, there are some major changes in how the National Assembly operates underway. The country's main rival parties have tentatively agreed to split the annual parliamentary audit of the government in two, starting this year. The decision was first announced during a meeting of main opposition Democratic Party lawmakers Thursday and later confirmed by the ruling Senuri Party. Under the tentative agreement, the National Assembly will split the 20-day annual audit of government offices into two parts, with one one part in the first half of the year and the other in the second half. The rival parties have also agreed to move up the deadline for the government to submit its annual budget proposal in time for the first of the two audit sessions. The parliament was deadlocked for much of last year due to a standoff between the rival parties, and there have been public demands to make the assembly more efficient. South Korea's top security officials came together on Thursday to discuss North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's recent inspections of special military units. The meeting at the presidential office of Cheong Wade was attended by Defense Minister Kim Guan Jin and Intelligence Chief Nam Jae Jun. Kim Jong-un's highly publicized visits to strategic units in recent days got the most attention. On Thursday, North Korean state media reported that Kim Jong-un had observed the training exercise of Unit 323 known to be a special Air Force unit, although the report did not mention when he made the trip. 
Kim visited the same unit following the nation's third nuclear test last February. President Bakane less than an hour ago returned home from her trip to India and Switzerland. During her visits in the two countries, she pushed ahead with her sales diplomacy pitch, seeking to provide more opportunities for Korean companies. Our presidential office correspondent Ah Jin-ju follows us this report. President Park's nine-day trip to India and Switzerland was focused on making it easier for Korean firms to enter overseas markets, calling for more investment in Korea, and seeking cooperation in the creative economy sector. Korea and India decided to upgrade their Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, or SIPA, in the near future by raising the trade liberalization level, which is under the current pact at 75 percent, 15 percent lower than the SIPA between India and Japan. President Park and Indian Prime Minister Mamohan Singh also agreed to revise the tax treaty between the two nations to prevent double taxation. President Peck was also able to secure promises from the Indian government to resolve the obstacles that have been blocking progress in POSCO's stall project to build a steel mill in the Indian state of Odisha for roughly nine years now. In Switzerland, President Buck and her Swiss counterpart Didier Burkhalter vowed to work together to realize a creative economy through technological cooperation and by fostering specialized personnel. Switzerland is a world-class technology country, and Korea is a world-class technology country. And Korea is a world-class technology country, so I think it will be the president visited one of the vocational schools in Bern to benchmark the systematic vocational training system of Switzerland. She also attended this year's World Economic Forum in Davos and called on the world's business leaders to look for investment opportunities in Korea's creative economy. During an opening speech at the first session of the global event, President Beck emphasized that the creative economy will lay a path to overcoming three major challenges facing the world, low growth, high unemployment and income disparities. Through startups, as well as the innovation of existing businesses, a creative economy can generate new engines of growth and can grow jobs. There will also be less income inequality since anyone with a great idea can live out one's dreams by starting a business. Addressing concerns about the cost of reunification, an issue that keeps foreign investors from pouring money into South Korea, President Park said reunification would be a jackpot not only for the two Koreas but also for neighboring countries. Speaking of creativity and innovation, Korea deserves a big pat on the back. Korea has been named the most innovative country in the world. Now that's according to Bloomberg, which gave Korea a score of 92.1 out of 100 for its ability to innovate. This year, Bloomberg's annual survey looked at 215 countries to determine how innovative they have been based on seven factors. Korea ranked second in the categories of patent activity and manufacturing capability and was weakest in productivity, ranking 33rd. Overall, Sweden was the second most innovative country, followed by the U.S., China and Japan. Digging deeper, getting to the bottom of stories that impact your life. Talking with you on air and online. Connecting you with heroes and experts to help you understand the world's most pressing issues. News and current affairs at its best with Moon Gun Young and Daniel Che on Early Edition at 6. The Korean economy appears to be moving into a phase of stable recovery. The central bank says the private sector is waking up from years of slumber to drive growth, although a major government spending cut forced a slightly lower growth rate in the October to December period. Arirang's Hwang Ji-hae has the details. 
There are signs that domestic demand is picking up steam and growth in the coming months is expected to be more balanced between exports and domestic activities. The Bank of Korea said Thursday that the economy grew 0.9 percent in the fourth quarter of last year from the previous quarter. That's down slightly from a 1.1 percent gain in the July to September period, but it was largely because of a major cutback in fiscal spending prompted by lower than expected tax revenues toward the end of the year. National tax revenue dropped last year by 1.1 trillion won, or roughly 1 billion U.S. dollars from 2012. And that resulted in a drop in government spending. This was the major factor behind the slower growth in the fourth quarter. The central bank added that the fourth quarter growth was spurred by rising domestic demand. It also confirmed that the economy grew 2.8 percent for all of 2013 from the previous year, as earlier projected. That compares with 2 percent growth in 2012 and represented a reversal of a two year slowdown. Concerns remain, however, about the nation's household debt and employment. The snowballing household debt problem, the rise in the number of jobs concentrated on those in their 50s, and low-quality jobs will put a strain on a further boost in domestic demand. The central bank said that the Korean economy will likely continue its recovery and forecast a growth of 3.8 percent for 2014 and 4 percent for 2015. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. As the most wired country on the planet, it's no surprise that a growing number of Koreans are doing their shopping online. But it might surprise you to know that for the first time ever, the market size of online shopping is likely to be larger than the retail sector this year. Our Connie Kim has more on the growth of this trend. Shin Hye Won is one of the many shoppers who prefers to purchase products online. From books and dog food to laptop computer cases, Kim clicks away on items that were on her shopping list. The changing landscape of technology is responsible for the change in the way people shop. Instead of heading out to stores, people now use their PCs and smartphones to buy what they want and need. I just bought dog food. It's much cheaper than retail stores or veterinary. I also have a variety of options to choose from, and promotional events are a special bonus. The online shopping market has seen steady growth at an annual rate of around 20 percent over the past three years, while the traditional method of shopping at retail stores grew by just 3 to 5 percent over the same period. The biggest reason for the boom in online shopping is convenience and price competitiveness. The profits come from a wide customer base located around the nation. From one-day delivery services to curated commerce, where customers are offered unique and personalized products, services have evolved to cater to different palettes. This year, the overall market size of online shopping is expected to surpass the retail store market for the first time ever, exceeding 45 billion U.S. dollars. Online shopping has been around for about 20 years, but the increase in purchases from smartphones is contributing to the growth of the market. With an explosive growth of mobile shopping among smartphone users, shopping on the go will be the new drive in the industry. Connie Kim, Arirang News. In an effort to work towards President Park Geun-hye's vision of a creative economy, the government has unveiled plans to attract talented foreigners and Korean residents living overseas to the nation. At a meeting led by Prime Minister Chung Hong won on Wednesday, the government aims to gradually increase the number of what it deems talented foreigners in the country by around 50 percent to more than 37,000 by the year 2017. To do that, they plan to make Korea a more attractive destination by enhancing services for foreigners, such as establishing a support center to help them adjust to Korean society. There are also plans to make the nation's immigration system more efficient and to extend the terms of F-2 visas from three years to five. Now turning to the bird flu crisis here in Korea, officials have confirmed that the dead ducks found in a river in central Korea were infected by the latest avian influenza. The five ducks found dead in Kumgang River suggest that the virus is spreading. The dead ducks were found about 50 kilometers north of Gochan County, where the highly pathogenic H5N8 strain of avian influenza was first found. 
So far, bird flu has been confirmed at a total of eight farms in Korea. Some 300,000 ducks and chickens have been culled since the virus was first confirmed a few days ago. Moving on to some pleasant news, the Korean trade official who was kidnapped in Libya earlier this week has been rescued, and he is now safe. Our foreign affairs correspondent Hwang sung -hee has the details. Three days after he was kidnapped, Korean trade official Han seok was safely rescued with the help of the Libyan government. Korea's foreign ministry said Thursday that Han, the head of the Korea Trade Investment Promotion Agency's unit in Libya, is in good health and has been handed over to the Korean embassy in Tripoli. Han was safely freed by the Libyan government at around midnight Thursday. Korea time. Han was safely freed by the Libyan government at around midnight Thursday, Korea time. And the Korean embassy received him at around 4 a.m. No health problems have been detected. The rescue operation was led by Libyan security forces, and they have arrested four kidnappers who are reportedly part of a small militia. The identity and motive of the kidnappers remain a mystery. And while there were reports that they asked for as much as two million U.S. dollars, the foreign ministry says no ransom money was handed over. Throughout the process of Han's rescue operation, the Korean government followed its principle of not paying ransom to kidnappers. After being interviewed by the embassy about his abduction, Han is expected to travel to the Mediterranean island of Malta, where he will meet up with his family before later returning to Korea. Whether Han returns to his post in Libya is undecided for now, but Kotra says the decision is solely up to him. Libya has struggled with violence and unrest in recent years following the ouster and death of dictator Muammar Gaddafi. And there are nearly 2,000 such armed militias operating across the country, with foreigners often targeted for abductions. As this was the first time a Korean was kidnapped in Libya, a Seoul's foreign ministry says it will thoroughly review the case to prevent similar incidents from happening again in the future. Hwang sang Arirang News. On January 16th, North Korea made a proposal to Seoul that both sides stop slandering each other and cease military provocations. And ever since it launched its peace offensive, Pyongyang has been demanding that Seoul accept its offer. Demanding. South Korea flatly rejected the proposal. But what now? For more, we are joined by Professor Kim dong yeol of Korea National Diplomatic Academy. Welcome to the program. Dr. Kim, please shed some light on this topic. Glad to be here. Yes, I will try my best. <laughs> Well, so North Korea has been quite persistent that South Korea accept its proposal, saying that it's aimed at improving inter-Korean relations. But of course, you know, this has been met with criticism here in Seoul mm -hmm. with the government questioning Pyongyang's true intentions. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your take? Um, I'm not sure how sincere they are in, quote-unquote, as, as, as they mentioned in the proposal, to end this mud signaling. Um, even I am dubious about the sincerity on that point. but. I am quite sure that they are very sincere, uh, that they are ready to negotiate with South Korean government or South Korean people to stop slandering or insulting the first family, the family of supreme uh, reverence. And then these days after, you know, the execution of Jiang um, uh, you know, it, it, it is impossible to say that um, the North Korean society would go calm as if nothing has happened. So definitely there will be something going on, not exactly as a commotion, the whole social commotion, but something going on. So they need to calm down the society as much as they can. And in that sense, to stop just, you know, the uh, uh, bad words about the first family or supreme commander is very, very, very necessary for their regime's uh, stability. So I think they are truly ready to negotiate with South Korean government about that. Well, we can uh, say for sure there are three things that we know for sure in life, death, taxes, and the unpredictability of North Korea. Sure. Uh, North Korea, they do have a pattern of like standing an olive branch and then suddenly, uh, after trying to split public opinion, they go ahead and launch some provocative actions and then place the blame on South Korea. That's been the pattern we have been seeing. Uh, will they be doing that? Do we expect a similar pattern this time since they already go on the peace and charm offensive? Pretty possible that they uh, uh, do make another provocation verbally, but I don't think they would provoke uh, militarily or using some of the military things at this time. 
because you know this is the best time. Well, the last time I would say uh, that they tried this kind of military action after, as I said, this uh, commotion in domestic politics. And uh, at this moment, I believe the entire world is actually giving a very watchful eyes to North Korean government, which is, you know, look very brutal uh, uh, and you know irresponsible. In just like I read, get, getting rid of uh, rid of this uh, uh, previous. Uh, one of the leaders of North Korean regime and also his own uncle. Uh, and then, you know, uh, at this moment, if North Korea is actually provoking militarily, I believe that is just like something like a suicide, I would say. So I don't think it's going to be, you know, it's a very serious military provocation, even though it's possible that they would just start another verbal provocation. So if not a military provocation, uh, what kind of provocation are we really talking about here? I know that the Defense Minister Kim Guan Jin uh, earlier, he said uh, North Korea may conduct another nuclear test uh, you know, between eight, January and March. You know, he gave out that warning earlier. What do you, what's your take? Well, as, as I said, then that kind of military action is less likely at this moment because I believe this is going to just like hurt instead of helping North Korean regime stability or uh, uh, whatever the uh, um, you know the economic benefits all the kind of things considered uh, instead definitely if they just give this kind of gesture to South Korea to calm down or you know uh, pacify the situation in the Korean Peninsula using this as an excuse the South Korean government rejected this and then you know just like uh, level up their uh, criticism about South Korea using the kind of usual words uh, uh, you know the running dog of American imperialism or uh, the you know whatever um, 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 the provocative actions by South Korea to to um, to invade North Korea those kind of things. Yeah. Well, North Korea definitely uh, temperamental and predictable, uh, but they are not suicidal. That's uh, one way of summing things up. Well, South Korean government brushed off North Korea's proposal, uh, saying that it's a camouflage peace offensive in the wake of. Uh, the upcoming U.S.-South Korea joint drills. Uh, do you feel that uh, Seoul did the right thing? I mean, it was this the best uh, response to Pyongyang's uh, gesture right now? I think it is a matter of interpretation, probably. On one hand, we may say that South Korea is losing a very precious chance to resume talks and then probably even go further uh, about this pacifying the situations in the Korean Peninsula. On the other hand, we said that South Korea is doing very, very properly at this moment, not to be again uh, uh, deceived by the North Korean uh, action, which is mostly disguised uh, 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 about their true action. Uh, um. But if that is the case, then I believe we have to compare the conditions that each side is setting for resuming talks or going for uh, um, 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 more like a you know, progressive way uh, of, of the situation in the Korean Peninsula. One condition which is uh, suggested by North Korean government uh, is to stop joint military exercise uh, between the United States and South Korea, which is again impossible in the eyes of South Korea. Whereas South Korea is asking North Korea to show some of this real sign of dismantling their nuclear weapons. So comparing the two, I wouldn't say that one is bigger than the other or one is more serious than the other. I mean, each side has a very legitimate uh, uh, request to the other side. Uh, uh, for the condition of resuming the talks. But I believe at this moment I would buy more of the South Korean uh, uh, response to North Korea at this moment because, you know, the, uh, the South Korea suggested to resume this um, re reunion of the separate families earlier. And then I believe that is pretty easy things for North Korea to take uh, unless they, are, they take too seriously to just uh, use this reunion for their economic benefits by reopening the tourism to Kumgangsan area. So if North Korea is taking this, it's going to be an easy step and then probably easily acceptable to South Korean government, but North Korea rejected it. So that's why I said that at this moment, South Korea is, you guys are even not accepting this, you know, very humanitarian reunion of the families. How would we accept your proposal at this moment? So that's why I say that I, I buy more of the South Korean response to North Korea than the North Korea's, you know, the uh, uh, request for this. So proposal. it's an equal and opposite reaction from South I Korea. I think so, yes. Mm. Well, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov has said that North Korea is signaling that it wants the long stalled uh, six party denuclearization talks be resumed uh, soon. Uh, will we see the talks resume anytime soon? What is your take? Um, definitely, I believe North Korea is, is, is trying to use this proposal 
as a kind of pre-step towards um, six-party talk because that's what they need badly at this moment after all this domestic, as, as I said, domestic political commotion. And then they try to, you know, show some of those positive signs to the world, says that North Korea is a rational, responsible country, and that they are ready to negotiate with other countries about not just nuclear uh, issues, but other issues as well, including this economic cooperation. But in that sense, then, in retrospect, if this six-party talk would be resumed uh, soon, in retrospect, we may say that that was definitely the first step uh, towards this six-party talk. But I am not sure at this moment, because again, as I said, I mean, I am not sure whether it is truly serious about ending this kind of hostile actions between the two sides. Uh, I believe at this moment, as I said, I repeat, uh, what they barely need at this moment is to stop slandering their first family. So I don't know how South Korea would accept this or not, but that was a matter of negotiation. But, you know, we are not sure yet. Well, thank you so much for coming in and sharing your insights with us, Professor Kim Dong-yeo. We look forward to having you back here soon. Right. Thank you very much. to get a check on the weather conditions with our Kim bo -kyung at the Weather Center. bo -kyung, give us the latest. Well, Yeonji, uh, we're seeing mild winter weather and temperatures jump to 8 degrees in some parts of the southern regions. I understand we can't say for sure that the fine dust is gone for good, though. That's right. As temperatures rise, there is a high chance that fine dust may come back with winds blowing from the west. Now, other than that, for those of you making plans for the weekend, keep in mind that nationwide showers are forecast for Saturday. Taking a look at tomorrow's readings, Seoul starts off the day at 0 degrees with a high of 8. Meanwhile, Busan makes it to 13. Moving on to other regions, Jeju hits 15 degrees while Dokdo tops out at 10. Well, that's all for now and back to you guys. Thank you for that, Bogyang. And that's all from us. This has been Daniel Cha. And I'm Kim Yeonji. Thank you for watching. And more news updates coming up at 8 p.m. Korea time.